Good morning. Hopefully everyone can hear me. I think that I've unmuted myself. Um, my name is Allison Kaplan. I'm Director of Education here at the First Ladies um, Library in Canton, Ohio. And I am excited to join you for our legacy lecture this morning. Uh, before we get started, I want to tell you about a few upcoming events here at the National First Ladies Library and Historic Site. Um, if you haven't gotten a chance to come out to the space, um, the Education Center currently has three exhibitions on view. Um, I'm having some technical issues this morning, so if I am a little frozen, I apologize. I'm going to quickly cycle through the activities and then I'm going to turn it over to Leslie. Um, so we have three great exhibitions, one about uh, First Ladies on the Campaign Trail, one about suffrage, and one about women who have run for president um, in the United States. So all very pertinent and all very exciting. Um, if you are not local to the museum, please tune in on Facebook, on social media on Thursdays, and you can get uh, tours from our curator and director of those exhibitions. They've been really fun and cool. So tune in for that, and I'm gonna give you a preview of some of our upcoming um, programs. So um, August 27th, we have a virtual book club event. We're reading Never Caught by Erica Armstrong Dunbar. Um, it's a really exciting story of um, George and Martha Washington's runaway slave. Um, the woman by the name of Ona Judge. And there's actually a young adult version of the book too. So um, it's a great, really fun read. We're all gonna hop on Zoom and discuss it on the 27th at noon. So that gives you plenty of time to check it out of the library, grab a copy and read it. It should be really fun. And I think it was just optioned as a um, TV series or film. So um, get on the bandwagon now and start reading and um, get ready to discuss that. And then on August 28th, we are going to have a virtual um, film screening. So you can hop on in celebration of um, uh, Women's Equality Day, we are screening the film Wonder Woman, um, not the actual fictional film, but uh, Wonder Woman, the untold story of the American superheroine. And um, it's going to be really awesome documentary, all sorts of background on the history of Wonder Woman and Wonder Woman's influence on uh, women today. So you, if you sign up for that event on our Eventbrite, you'll have access to the film for one week. And we will also be um, connecting to the director of that film on Zoom for Women's Equality Day to chat with her. So I'm really excited about that. Um, we also have two really cool virtual First Ladies Nights coming up. Um, I think it's the last day to get in on the string art if you're interested in that. But we also in September, September 9th, are doing a history of silhouettes. So you can join us for a free talk and if you're interested for an added charge, you can actually get a silhouette of your own. Um, so we are very excited for that presentation. That's September 9th at 4 p.m. And then just a preview of the fall, um, we will have David Giffels, uh, otherwise known as the Bard of Akron. Um, local writer David Giffels is going to join us to discuss his new book called Barnstorming Ohio um, to Understand America. And he actually stopped by uh, the National First Ladies Library and Historic Site and it is featured in the book. So we'll get more details about that um, as October rolls around, but that will be our October legacy lecture. Um, we also have a lot of great uh, National Park Service films up, up on um, our fa uh, their Facebook page. So you can connect up to those, learn all about um, Lady Bird Johnson, the history of First Ladies and Civil Unrest. They've been really, really good and really, really fun. And if you have any young children at home, Fun with Flotus this week is going to feature a really cool story about the history of the song Take Me Out to the Ball Game, which has a suffrage roots. 
So we're really excited about that. And without further ado, I am going to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Leslie Heafy is the Associate Professor of History at Kent State University at Stark. She's written or edited six books and numerous book chapters and articles about the Negro League and women's baseball. Dr. Heafy currently serves as Vice President and Chair of the Women in Baseball Committee for the Society for American Baseball Research and also serves on the board for the International Women's Baseball Center. So I am going to turn my Max Headroom self off and hopefully the glitching will stop and I'm going to turn things over to Leslie. So thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you very much for that introduction, Allison, and I hope everybody can hear me. Somebody will let me know if you can't. Um, but it, I'm happy to be here with you this morning this is to talk a little bit of sports. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you, and hopefully everybody can see this um, so that you can listen to me and see what we're going to talk about. Um, and it was a nice segue from Allison's last comment about the song, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, um, because certainly there are uh, great connections to that, to what I'm talking about today. Um, as you can see, I kind of chose a couple of pictures to get us started um, in thinking about the, the long history. And obviously, um, in about 45 minutes, I can't give you the full history of women in sports in the United States, because that's what I'm going to focus on. But I can certainly give you some highlights um, that, but knowing that women have always participated, just like anybody else, because whether you're talking games or sports or whatever it might be, right, we all, we all take part. It's a part of our human nature. It's something that we need to do, um, whether it's in baseball or any other sport that we look at. So um, I'm going to take us through um, some discussion at some early sports. And I, I'm going to start and focus mostly on the 19th and then the 20th century, recognizing that certainly there were sporting activities before that. And so these two pictures just highlight a little bit of that. And you can find lots of discussions of early American sport. There's a great book called Puritans at Play. And yes, I know that sounds like a little bit of a, a, a disconnect, right? The Puritans we tend to think of as individuals who were very um, stayed and they didn't like enjoyment and things like that. And yet Puritans at Play would highly illustrate that they did play just like anybody else did. They simply looked at it very differently than we do today. Um, dancing by yourself in a room was considered play, uh, playing the piano, right, in the same way that we would think of um, today. Um, and so certain activities were certainly more acceptable for women, depending on what class you were in. And so fishing, as you can see in the top painting there, um, women of a particular class. Lower bottom is battledore shuttlecock, what we would think of today as badminton, um, something that opened up the ranks. But the similarity between the two is that much of the activity that was accepted for women early on were things that didn't strain them too much. And when I say that, I mean both physically and mentally. All the way through the 19th century, there was a belief among some at least, and there were even so-called, and I will say so-called, scientific studies that were done that said that there was a certain percentage of brain use that we have, and that if you, uh, if women use too much physical activity, it would take away from that. And they actually tried to come up with percentages and things like that. So they had some crazy ideas about what you could and could not do. Um, here are a couple more examples of some of that early idea of women. And again, notice the class that is being represented here um, by their attire even by the fans that are sitting there. But again, something that's individual. So there's not a lot of team competition, not a lot of uh, danger of physical contact, things like that, which were important in early expectations of sport. Um, and notice the predominance of white. Again, that, focusing on that sense of purity and the kind of image that you wanted to project. And it's kind of interesting that these are late 18th century, 19th century imagery into the 20th, but even in the 21st century, we still see some interesting things happening with imagery in women in sports. So, um, so quick background on some of that early. Um, what happens as we move into the 19th century as we become a new nation is we start to see um, importation of ideas from other countries, 
particularly England and Germany. Um, and here's an example of something that came out of London, as you can see in 1837, called Exercises for Ladies to Preserve and Improve Beauty to Prevent and Correct Personal Defects. Not something we usually think about when we think about women's participation in sporting activities. Um, but this was the idea that if you're going to find a way to make it acceptable, it had to be something for men. It was generally in moderation and often, well, if it was teaching them a skill, if it was something that allowed them to, you know, for example, you fish and you bring home dinner for the family. For women, it was, if it was a way to reinforce the stereotypes of the time period, then the activity was okay. And then others will come along to challenge that. So here's a piece coming out of London, which then led to um, our own ideas. And Catherine Beecher is a name that people sometimes recognize from the famous Beecher family. Um, Catherine was very much a proponent of education. And so looking at this idea of adding calisthenics, gymnastics we would think of today, here's a piece from 1858 looking at what was going to be acceptable for women's sports, women's activities. Um, and they give you, and it's basically a book that walks you through different exercises. Um, and here you can see they're doing some weightlifting. Um, my favorite one is with the Indian bells that look like um, bowling pins and that you simply walk around uh, carrying them. But Catherine Beecher was one of the big proponents of trying to take the German and British ideas of adding some of these activities so that you are improving a woman's mind, body, and of course, soul, so that you can uh, put all those pieces together. Um, but they're up against the challenges of the day. And so um, here are a couple more examples as we start to maybe get a little more um, activity going on. So in the top one, you see again, another gymnastics kind of idea. Um, she's not actually going to ever swing on that uh, pole. Um, she's just simply pushing it back and forth and back and forth. Um, and then in the bottom one, we of course have um, dance moves. And so those are considered part of a women's sporting activity or a women's activity that these were uh, being promoted through the various pamphlets and things of, of the day. And this is going to continue through much of the 19th century as the predominant way that women are encouraged to do anything physical. Because what you're looking for, again, is something that doesn't challenge the gender norms of the day, the class norms of the day, um, the race norms of the day. And then again, also the supposed scientific beliefs that a woman's place was in certain areas and not others, right? And so you didn't want um, too much physical activity because they not only believed it affected your mental capacity, as I said, but the bigger concern was that you could do damage to yourself and therefore affect your ability to have children or healthy children because they didn't yet make the connection that the healthier a woman was, the greater likelihood that she would have healthy children. Um, and so these were all concerns that you had to get around. So a lot of the newspaper coverage in the 19th century tended to focus on things that um, were acceptable and then to downplay and to make the women who participated in other things look less desirable. And then a big challenge came um, in the mid 19th century. Um, and you might or might not recognize this lady, but I suspect that you will recognize the second picture. Um, Amelia Bloomer, of course, made an interesting um, change for women in the mid 19th century when she introduced um, what we think of as the bloomer pants that would allow a little more movement for women. Didn't necessarily get rid of the corsets and all those kinds of things yet, um, but certainly allowed for a little more movement. But as you can imagine, when they first came out, they were not incredibly well received. And in fact, it's going to take almost to the end of the 19th century before so almost 50 years before they become more popular and more acceptable. But in some ways, they're going to have a profound effect on women's participation in sports, not something that we often think about. And here's the reason why. Because it's going to have a profound influence on women cycling. And so up in the top corner, you see the picture of the more typical kind of idea of women on a, in their long skirts riding their bicycles, right? And so think about that as yourselves, right? A form of exercise, at least on a horse, you could ride side saddle, things like that. So the concern of course was getting your skirts caught in the spokes of the bike. Um, and so the bloomers, as you can see from the middle picture, end up having an acceptance and increasing the amount of women cyclists that you see in the 1890s. 
Um, the book in the top corner is, of course, Frances Willard writing about her own How I Learned to Ride a Bicycle, um, A Wheel Within a Wheel. Frances Willard, of course, we associate with the temperance movement and suffrage and things of that sort. And yet here she is writing a book about bicycling. There are a number of races that start in the 1890s for women cyclists as well as men. And in fact, there's a national cy cycling association, kind of like um, the AAA today for automobiles. And they had two interesting rules that were established in the National Book of Rules. Um, and it tells you how much women were now participating. One of them talked about um, warning men that they couldn't pass what you would call wobblies. And what they defined a wobbly was a woman on a bicycle. And the fear was, of course, that if you passed her too quickly, she would get scared and she would fall off her bike because she wobbled. She wasn't too steady on the bicycle. Isn't that great? And then the other one was a fine to men for spinning. And the concern was not that it was unhygienic or anything like that. It was as they were riding their bikes, there might be a woman behind them and the spit would fall. And that was very ungentlemanly. And so it sort of gives you a clue of where we see some changes taking place. So cycling is going to be one of the big areas. And of course that opens up then all kinds of other opportunities for women um, to participate. And again, it's something individual, not something that's necessarily team competition, those kinds of things. And that's what makes much of early women's sports um, very acceptable to uh, people. Um, and so the other big sport of the 19th century, and you knew I was going to talk about this, I hope, is baseball, of course. Um, and the picture here are the Vassar Resolutes, a uh, women's college team. Um, the Vassar Resolutes are from the late 1860s, um, but there were teams playing at Vassar from the early 1860s. 1860s is really the time period just in general when we see baseball spreading across the country. Um, and we generally think about that for men, but it was happening for women as well. And where we see it start really is going to be on the college scene. So today when we see women participating in baseball and people are talking about it as if this is something new, as we often know in history, it's never very little is new. It's just simply we didn't know about it. So the Vassar Resolutes um, start as a inter intra collegiate team. Most of the colleges, Smith, other women's colleges, they w started baseball teams to play internally. So it'd be like sophomores playing junior juniors and seniors playing freshmen, that kind of thing. And then gradually developing an intercollegiate uh, approach. But the Vassar Resolutes we know a great deal about because one of the players, a young lady by the name of Annie Glidden, um, writes about it in her diary and sends letters to her brother asking for his um, equip uh, equipment so that they could use it. Um, the typical idea at most colleges was if they allowed it, um, it was to be done where you couldn't be seen so imagine playing a baseball game and having to play behind your school so that people passing by would not actually see you playing. Um, so that was one of often the conditions. The other, of course, was that you would stop a team and stop the sport in general if something got broken. And they didn't necessarily mean your arm or your leg, because we have an account at uh, one college where player hit a ball through a window and broke the window and that put an end to their participation um, in the sport. And so um, the other thing, of course, that you can see in these early pictures is the attire doesn't change. And so women were playing throughout the 19th century, but a lot of them were playing in long skirts. Um, of course, they're playing at a time when baseball still had rules when you were not playing in the professional ranks where you could catch the ball on one bounce. So there was some advantage to having that long skirt because you could smother the ball. Unfortunately, most newspaper articles would talk about how ridiculous they looked running around, how often they tripped over their skirts, things like that. So this was not something that the newspapers were touting as um, acceptable for women. Um, in fact, uh, Sylvester Wilson, who was one of the biggest promoters of women's baseball in the 19th century, um, changed his name many, many times and got run out of town in a lot of places because he was a very unscrupulous character who seemed to be um, recruiting young ladies for more than just baseball. Um, and so that added to that reputation that, see, these are not things that women should be doing. Now, just to add another layer to this, um, African-American women also participated in um, baseball in particular. This picture is actually from the uh, late 19 teens, 
It's a YMCA Phyllis Wheatley softball team, um, or baseball team, sorry. Um, but it's often shown in a lot of research as being a 19th century women's black baseball team called the Dolly Vardens. Um, it's actually not. But the Dolly Vardens were um, a women's African-American women's baseball team in the 1880s playing in Philadelphia. And there were actually two Dolly Varden teams that typically played one another and simply identified in the newspapers as Dolly Varden one and Dolly Varden two. Um, but again, just showing the breadth of women's participation, um, starting to challenge some of those ideas and seeing how far they could push society to accept what they were doing. Newspaper articles few and far between on a lot of these teams. Um, and sometimes when you read the scores, you'll read a score, for example, of a game, and it might be 41 to 37, and you're thinking, how can that be a baseball game? Well, it tells you something about maybe the quality of some of the play of some of the, because they're not getting a chance to practice things like that. Um, and so, but they were playing and that will continue all the way through um, the 19th century. College teams will um, be added to by what we called the Reds and the Blues and then the Bloomer teams. Uh, the Reds and the Blues were simply identified as baseball teams who wore typically either red belts or blue belts on their dresses. And then the bloomer teams, as you can imagine, simply adopting the bloomer uniform. So as we move into the 20th century, that's what you see happening. And so again, you can see that influence of the bloomers taking off and cycling and then spreading their influence into other sports and other opportunities for women. Um, here's an example of that. This is Lizzie Arlington. Lizzie Arlington, as you can see her in her um, nicely striped bloomers, um, advertised, truthfully advertised and honestly conducted, high class organization. You can bring out the ladies. Arlington was pitching for a team in Reading, Pennsylvania in 1898 um, and then went on to continue to pitch on women's teams. So she's one of those few examples in the 19th century of a woman participating on a men's team um, and getting a good deal of publicity um, for her exploits. Um, we also have very few women who have umpired in the game um, on the professional ranks. We have eight total right up to the present day. There are two currently in the minor leagues, but this is the first. This is Amanda Clement. Um, Amanda Clement umpired starting in about 1905 um, all the way through the early 19 teens. Um, got her start because she showed up at one of her brother's games and the umpire didn't appear. And so they asked her if she would be willing. He got his friends to agree to let her umpire for them. Um, and she earned enough money umpiring to pay for college. And so that's what she was doing it for. Um, and as you can imagine, the newspaper articles, um, some not so complimentary, but surprisingly often fairly complimentary to her um, knowledge of the game, which is what they were most impressed by. Okay? Um, continuing that bloomer uh, approach, here is probably one of the most famous uh, women baseball players of the early part of the 20th century, Maud Nelson. Um, Nelson um, was a pitcher, an outfielder, a manager, and an owner of her own teams. Um, her husband, um, John Nelson, eventually um, will buy a team for her to be able to run herself. Um, there's a current campaign going on right now to try to convince the Baseball Hall of Fame to uh, put Maud Nelson in the hall. Um, We'll see how that goes. The vote will come up the end of this year. Um, but recognizing she, her most famous team that she participated with were the New York Bloomers, and they played all the way through the 1920s into the early 1930s um, before women's baseball is going to kind of disappear and then come back. Um, and so um, had to throw in an Ohio connection, certainly. This is Alta Weiss. Alta Weiss um, in, from the Berlin, Rakersville area. She, um, that's, Rakersville is where she, um, is where she died. Um, but she grew up in that area of Ohio and became a very famous pitcher up and around the Cleveland area. Uh, her father would take her up there to pitch for a team called the Independents um, and a number of other local teams um, on men's teams. And she was a very popular draw. And eventually she's going to have her own team called the Weiss All-Stars. Um, and so another of the, and she chose, unlike Maude Nelson, as you can see, she was not playing in the Bloomers, um, but a much looser skirt than you would have seen um, in some of the earlier uh, expectations. Bringing us forward into the 1930s, some of you may or may not have 
heard the name Jackie Mitchell. Uh, that's the young lady on the far side um, in the Chattanooga uniform. Uh, Mitchell is uh, famous for a particular incident in women's sports history, where in uh, 1931, she is going to be brought in for an exhibition game and she will pitch and strike out Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig and Tony Lazari. Um, and of course, the question has always been, did she really strike out Babe Ruth? Babe Ruth, of course, said no. Lou Gehrig kind of had the opposite view. Um, most people today would say, yeah, knowing who, what was happening at the time, bit of a publicity stunt, doesn't mean she wasn't a good pitcher. She went on to pitch for the junior lookouts in Chattanooga and then for and against the House of David team. So a good example of how baseball is going to progress for women um, through the 1930s before things will um, change a little bit. Um, so switching gears just a little bit to show you a few other examples of women's participation in sport. Um, another acceptable was the idea of ice skating. Um, and it was much more acceptable to simply skate like these three ladies are here than to actually participate, for example, in, say, an ice hockey game or something like that, at least early on. This was considered good exercise. Again, you could do it individually. You didn't have any worry about physical contact. Um, and those were all important considerations. And as you can obviously tell from this picture, these are women of a particular class, once again. And so that also important aspect. But at the same time, we do have women who are going to start to participate in um, hockey. And here we have, I just, I like this picture myself simply because it's from the late 1890s. Um, I look at their attire out on the ice and that is not your typical um, idea that you would be dressed that way. Um, but again, you can see a class difference here. These are girls playing. But what this leads to, of course, is going to be the development of women's ice hockey. And we have teams as early as the late 1890s playing hockey in kind of out of the way places. It's not something that's going to take off all across the country. Though today, uh, women's ice hockey is a fairly popular sport, particularly at the college level. And so kind of interesting to see where that has developed and baseball has not. Um, and so the interesting differences in some of our sports. But here's an example of it from 1899, um, a women's ice hockey team. And many of these teams, as you can imagine, were in places like Minnesota and that area um, where still hockey is very much the, the, the sport. Um, and so a women's ice hockey team uh, and recognizable equipment, those kinds of things that we would expect to see. Uh, not a lot of newspaper coverage, so a little hard to track down. Wasn't a particularly popular sport in the United States then or now. And so that's kind of an interesting that that has continued. Um, but uh, another sport that you might not have expected to see um, and obviously looks very different is boxing. Um, and this particular picture, if you just looked at it, if you didn't see the punching bag, you'd be like, okay, that just looks like exercise. Um, but this is Nell Saunders. Um, and Nell Saunders was in a boxing match with Rose Harland in 1876 in New York City. It was a theater that put on the match between the two women. And this is one of the first recorded official boxing matches in the United States between two women. Um, and interestingly, that was how they dressed. And they were not fighting for money. They were actually fighting. The prize was a silver um, candy dish. And so that's what um, Nell Saunders won in that particular uh, match. Um, here's another example of an early um, boxing match. And you can see a little bit of a difference in attire. They are wearing boxing gloves, where Saunders was not. Um, and of course, just to see where it's progressed, here's Ronda Rousey um, in much more in the last couple of years in a women's uh, UFC fighting match. Um, and so we have Layla Lee and a variety of others who participate um, today. So you can see the progression, but it's not typically something we see and think about from the 19th century, but there, it certainly was there, as were women wrestlers, which again, not something that you necessarily think about. Okay? Um, basketball was another sport. Um, unlike many of the other um, primary sports that we tend to think about, baseball, football, soccer, basketball, when it began, Right from the start, 1891, when it is established, um, this bottom picture is Senda Berenson in the center um, at Springfield, decided to adapt the rules immediately for women. And so women are gonna participate in basketball from the very start. Now, the big difference, of course, will be, again, trying to create a sport 
um, that is not typical of the picture up in the top left, but more typical of the one on the bottom, where you stayed in one spot on the court, you did not dribble and you did not run down the court. And so typically playing with six players um, and you had a specific spot on the court so that you limited the physical activity. Obviously basketball has come a long way. Um, one of the more famous teams that helped promote women's basketball in the first half of the 20th century um, are the American Redheads, as you can see in this picture. Um, they played for 50 years. They were sort of the equivalent of the Harlem Globetrotters on the women's side. Um, C.M. Olson was the founder of the team. Um, this particular team, they all look like redheads, but you didn't have to actually be and know they didn't necessarily have to wear wigs. They were simply called the American Redheads and they barnstormed all across the US and Canada and played some games in Mexico and some other places um, all for that 50 year time period and really helped promote. Um, this is a picture of them being inducted into the Missouri Sports Hall of Fame um, as a result. And they went in as a group, not with any single t particular team. Um, and then of course, as we move forward in basketball, you have the Women's American Basketball Association, which was a fairly short lived effort. Some people may not even remember it. Part of its issue was the uniforms, um, the spandex idea, which didn't sit well with a lot of people. Um, and it was more a um, publicity stunt on, on one level, so it didn't last. Um, so it was around in the 1990s. And then of course that gave rise to um, the WNBA. And here's Lisa Leslie, one of the early proponents of the WNBA, which succeeds to the present day with the support of the NBA. And um, lots of fun to watch. And so you can see sort of the progression there um, as we look at basketball. But basketball was one of those sports, like I said, it kind of built off the gymnastics idea in schools. That's what Sunda Berenson was doing when she introduced it at Springfield and said, if men can play and boys can play this in school, so can girls. And so that was kind of the idea of adapting it right from the beginning, which is why some would argue it's as acceptable today as it is, unlike some other sports that didn't start that way, baseball in particular being that example. Okay? Um, the Olympics certainly have helped um, promote women's sports. Uh, women participated starting in the very first Olympics in 1900 in two sports, tennis and golf. And that again goes back to that idea, tennis and golf, upper class, not very physical, those kinds of things. There were 19 women who participated in 1900. Uh, 1904, one sport, archery. So we kind of went backwards after that first one. And then you'll see in 1908, we add figure skating um, to the archery and they brought tennis and golf. And so there were 36 um, women that participated for the US team. Um, again, but notice the sports that are being introduced early on. Um, by 1912, we start to see an expansion with we add horseback riding and diving and swimming Okay. Um, and so we see the number go up. And then in 1920, we finally reach um, over 70 when we add yachting, and that's doubles, and tennis is brought back. And so the progression in women's Olympic um, activity to where we are today certainly has helped promote. Um, but it's interesting, the choices of women's sports sometimes, um, for example, women's softball, but not women's baseball uh, and, and things like that over the course of the time. This is simply a picture of the part of the 1920s uh, US team. And I wanted to show you it because you remember those earlier pictures of women in the white uniforms and the white dresses. Well, here they are, of course, uh, marching in with white skirts. Uh, and so again, 1920, this is part of the, the tennis and the golf um, and the equestrian team that is um, sitting in this particular picture, 1920. As we move forward, the big change will be with the addition of track and field in the 1930s. And here are two quick examples um, of Tidy Pickett on the far left and uh, Louise Stokes on uh, the right. Um, in the 1932 Olympics, the Olympics we think of most for uh, Jesse Owens and his encounters with Adolf Hitler. Um, this is an example of what was happening by the 30s and 40s as HBCUs and others were introducing um, women's sports, track and field in particular. And so we're going to see the Tennessee Tigers, for example. Um, but 
uh, Stokes will also participate in the 36 Olympics as well. Um, and so that's the uniform that you see here in here. Um, and so we start to see track and field, but for African American women, much more so than white women. And so mentioned class differences, we see racial differences as well. Um, two other of the early track stars, one most people know a little better in the USA uniform, that of course is Wilma Rudolph, first woman of any to win three gold medals at an Olympics in 1960, sprinter and high jumper. And then Alice Coachman on the other side, first American woman to win any Olympic gold, um, and she was in the high jump. And so these are two of our earliest, uh, again, in track and field areas. Um, most African-American women have participated in summer Olympics. Uh, Vena Flowers is one of the few um, African-American women to participate in the Winter Olympics as a bobsledder um, in much more recent Olympic history. Swimming, big opportunity here. This is Gertrude Ederle. Um, Gertrude Ederle and her sister were both um, swimmers in their school. And Gertrude Ederle, of course, is the first woman to successfully swim the English Channel in 1926. At the time that she did this, um, she broke the men's record by over three hours. Um, and of course, everybody said it couldn't be done. And then it took almost two years for a man to come back and break her record. Um, the first time she went out, she attempted it twice. Her father was in the boat that followed and she got looked what he thought was getting tired. He actually pulled her out of the, the water. So the second time she went out, she took her sister instead so that her father wouldn't pull her out of the water. Um, when she finished her swimming in the English Channel, she's gonna get a ticker tape parade in France and then in New York City. The one in New York City, first for a female athlete, simply because the French had done it first and the Americans didn't want to be outplayed by the French. And so uh, Gertrude Ederle, um, and her big change here is starting to make swimsuits actually something that uh, you could actually swim in instead of the long sleeves and the long legs that most um, swimming outfits had prior to this idea. Um, first woman to make the cover, a sporting woman to make the cover of Time Magazine comes in 1924 uh, in golf. This is Edith Cummings, who qualified for the US Amateur in 1919, made the cover in 1924. And as you can tell by her attire, they referred to her in the newspapers as the fairway flapper, uh, which tells you a little bit about how they viewed her participation, uh, women's participation in general, um, but she made a, a big name for herself in the world of golf um, starting in the 1920s. Going back a little bit to baseball, talked about players earlier. This is a picture of the National League uh, owners in 1911, and that is Helene Britton of the, Helene Hathaway Britton of the St. Louis Cardinals, who took over after her husband died as the first female owner of a major league team as early as 1911. Um, and I love this picture. It's a typical, look how stern they all look. And they're making her stand behind them. Um, it's a very fascinating picture to take a look at and think about. Other quick examples of female owners. Um, we of course have Joan Payson of the New York Mets. I always like to mention Payson because Payson is the only female owner to date who actually bought a team outright and didn't inherit it from her father or her husband or some family member. Um, takes over when the Mets um, first come into operation in 1962 and will control the Mets through the 1970s. So she's there for their first World Series win in 1969. And there's great stories about Joan Payson that I can tell you about her love of the Mets and horseback riding and art. Those were her three loves. Today, there are also women who um, participate on high levels of game. This is Kim Ang, who is um, and was the assistant GM of the Los Angeles Dodgers and now works in the Major League Baseball office. So improvements on that level. Okay. But for most people, the most famous area of women's baseball, of course, is the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League of the 1940s, a league that lasted from 1943 to 1954, all based out here in the Midwest, though no particular teams in Ohio, um, Illinois and Wisconsin um, being the two biggest areas. Um, this is a 1946 All-Star team that you are seeing here um, and another picture. And of course, these two pictures highlight one of the, the biggest issues, which is um, for the women's team at the time coming through World War II, they were supposed to be women first and ballplayers second. So you take a look at the picture and tell me, are they reinforcing that idea? Of course they are. 
and they're reinforcing it with the skirts that the women are wearing. And so um, that particular idea is a really significant one. Um, and again, this league was meant to last only through the end of World War II. Uh, Philip Wrigley starts it. And then when the war is over, the women in themselves buy up the franchises and it continues through 1954 when television really is one of the primary reasons why the league disappears. Um, but if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you watch A League of Their Own. It's a fairly accurate historical movie and I don't say that very often. Um, and then of course, moving it up after that league ended in 54, Eleanor Engel will try to sign a contract with the Harrisburg uh, Senators minor league team. That contract is voided and the minor league president at the time says about women playing baseball over my dead body. Um, I always say now, well, he's dead, so we could. And so here is Monet Davis, uh, the little league pitcher um, with Mamie Peanut Johnson, who went to a tryout for the All-American League and was turned away. And so here she is um, many, many years later having pitched as one of three women who pitched in the Negro Leagues. Um, and she pitched in the Negro Leagues in the 1950s um, and played alongside Tony Stone and Connie Morgan. So while she didn't get to play in the All-American League, she did end up pitching and she says the All-American League's turning her away was the best thing that ever happened to her because she then got to be the first woman to pitch um, in a professional men's game in 1953. Um, and so she got that opportunity. Can't talk about women in sports without talking a little bit about Babe Diedrichsen. And so here are some pictures of um, Diedrichsen in her various sports. And this tells you pretty much all you have to know about Diedrichsen. She participated at an elite level uh, at every sport that she um, took part in. She was a professional in golf. She was a pitcher in baseball. She took part in the Olympics, basketball. Um, she is generally considered to be the best female athlete of the first half of the 20th century and generally in the top five or 10 for the entire 20th century. And so certainly somebody worthy of um, more discussion and more reading about her various exploits. Just bringing it forward a little bit, here are we see women's soccer and you can see where it started and the very famous picture of Brandy Chastain um, and the coverage it got when she threw off her shirt um, to celebrate the same way a man would do. And of course, um, was vilified um, for that particular action on the field. Um, that early team is from Hawaii in 1907. I wanted to sort of conclude all of this by bringing up one really big piece of information that changes the world of sports into what we tend to recognize today. And that is, of course, the passage of Title IX in 1972. Here is the actual language. Title IX was part of a much larger education act that was geared towards um, math and science education in the classroom. And this was kind of added in. But you'll notice it says that on the basis of sex, they can't be excluded from participation in any educational program. And of course, that meant sports. This bottom graph just gives you a little bit of an idea of how much things are going to change. And I'm guessing many of us, like myself, uh, came along after the, and so we benefited from Title IX and got to participate in ways that others did not. Um, this just gives you a little bit of the numbers. And so you can see the participation in the 1970s to 2005. So just under 300,000 to just almost 3 million um, in high school and then in um, college, you can see not quite the same increase, um, and a lot of that has to do with scholarship issues, but certainly uh, gives you a feel for the impact of Title IX on women's sports. And we could talk, and I could certainly answer questions about the ways that Title IX has been used or abused um, in promoting women's sports. Um, but I thought I'd end uh, with a um, couple talks about women's football, since obviously this is also the year of the 100th anniversary of the NFL. This is um, the Toledo Troopers playing in the 1970s, probably the most famous and most successful women's um, football team, but it might surprise people to know it goes all the way back to the 1970s. Uh, Linda Jefferson here on the cover of Women's Sport as Player of the Year. Uh, Jefferson was actually invited by the Football Hall of Fame um, to one of their um, Monday luncheons as um, a star athlete and they wanted to hear about her story and there was talk at the time of trying to get her um, 
elected to the Hall of Fame for her um, exploits as a receiver, for the most part, quarterback as well. Um, but the Toledo Troopers won a number of championships in the 1970s um, as one of the premier teams um, in the Women's Football League then. And of course, here's where we are today. Um, here, this is a picture of the Phoenix Phantoms. They've changed their uniform for this year, unfortunately not getting to play, of course. Um, they are part of the Women's Football Alliance. And the Women's Football Alliance today has between 50 and 60 teams all across the country um, playing women's football. Two of their most famous alumni are Katie Sowers. You might have seen her um, on the sidelines in the Super Bowl the San Francisco 49ers, and Jennifer King, who was picked up by the Washington Redskins as their uh, first female African-American coach in the NFL. So football, women's football is a much bigger sport than most people realize. And um, the Women's Football Alliance, if they had played this year, had just picked up a contract to have some of their games picked up on a um, couple of uh, smaller television stations. And so a growing interest in uh, women's participation in football. And then I end simply with Here's where we are today. So if I started with those pictures, if you remember, with the women in the uh, fishing in the boat, um, playing battle door and shuttlecocks, and here we are with Rapineau in the women's soccer, Simone Biles, Lindsay Cohn, the Williams sisters, Danica Patrick, right? And so you can see the growth that has taken place. And so um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point and simply say thank you for your kind attention. And I'm happy to answer if there are questions. Thank you so much, Leslie. That was so interesting. And you really covered a large span of history, <laughs> which was amazing. Um, let's see, we have, there's a lot of chat in the um, Zoom space, I think just commenting, but um, we have a, I have a few questions for you. I wondered about, um, I was just reading about activism in the WNBA. I know that um, there are many sports stars out there who are using their voice to speak out about um, many issues that are happening throughout the world right now. I wondered how that has impacted women's sports. Um, well, the WNBA in particular has taken the stand that they are going to follow suit with many, of, and, and they've chosen this themselves, um, to uh, think about the national anthem and kneeling for the national anthem as one of their examples of a way to show solidarity and show support for. Um, and there have been a number of um, the different athletes who have spoken out and have participated um, across the country in some of the Black Lives Matters in particular um, events that have been going on. Um, but then, but, the, but this is not new. It's, it's typically been a part of um, particularly women's basketball and women's soccer. As somebody uh, was asking a little bit about the, the soccer lawsuit that's going, right? Um, but the idea that women have often used their voices and maybe and some have wondered why maybe a little bit more than men and part of it I think is simply um, they don't have as much to lose maybe in terms of uh, in one way in one respect at least that's what some people think I, I would tend to argue differently but that idea or that perception that they don't have the the millions of dollars to lose and things but you could also argue they've had to fight really hard to get where they are and so they risk losing pretty much more on that level. But I think of, um, you know, you go back to the, even the 19, uh, late 1960s, 1970s, uh, as part of the push for Title IX, right? That's a equality and equity issue that women were very much involved in. And some of the leading figures in trying to test the early um, idea of Title IX were girls who wanted to play Little League. And these were nine and 10 year old girls who are challenging our la the laws, right? And, and these perceptions and they were willing to, do so I think it's always been a part of um, what women have done. Um, another question here about uh, gender identity as, as we're reconsidering um, gender and sex um, and redefining it, thinking about when um, people like Stella Walsh who, um, who really impacted uh, sports. Um, how will gender play a role, do you think, as things progress in sports? That's a really interesting question that I don't know the 
how that anybody really has a good answer for um, because it, it's simply seen as another challenge, um, another obstacle to overcome. Um, but I think in some ways, it feels like the efforts of Walsh and others um, are maybe leading the way instead of following society. Um, and maybe it's because you're testing it on a smaller grounds um, to see how, how this plays out. Um, I think it's gonna depend, unfortunately, but this has always been true, also on the sport. It's not going to be an even change as we move forward. Um, women's participation in various sports is very different. You know, the acceptance of women in, in hockey, for example, and basketball and even football is much more so than it is in baseball, which is not what you would necessarily think, particularly if, if you sort of compare football to baseball, right? And think about the idea of, uh, well, one's a contact sport where you can get really badly hurt, right? And, we think, and yet women, part the idea of women participating in football and the expansion of women's football. So I think we're going to see the same thing in this larger question where it may be depend very dependent on the sport. But I maybe I like to hope that we will see sports lead the way instead of follow in this particular case. Um, and maybe because it's on a smaller scale. Someone in the chat is asking, what about colleges disproportionately downgrading women's sports to club sports like Brown is doing? And just thinking about some of the economic turmoil that colleges and universities are going through right now and changing yeah, it's, in the it's, sport, how will that impact uh, Title IX and women's sport? Well, unfortunately, part of the issue is has always been there and it's, part of the idea of how people have misused what Title IX actually said, and they've used it to pit, and that's what's continuing to happen, right, today, pit men's sports against women's sports at the college level, at the high school level, and, be, and, and even lower, where it's sort of, it's one or the other, you can't have both. And they say that that's what Title IX says, right? So that you, and they take Title IX and say that you have to have equal money spent, on men's sports and women's sports. And so therefore, to bring in a women's sport, you have to take away a men's sport. That's actually not what Title IX says. Title IX historically has three different ways that you can actually meet. And none of them actually say that, but that's, and unfortunately that then made women's sports the bad guy, right? And so early on it was women's sports were brought in and you took away typically men's wrestling. And that was the big one. Um, and so it was then seen as women were the bad guys. The, these are, these are, they have caused you to lose your opportunity to play. And that's the same thing, unfortunately, that seems to be occurring right now with the economic situation that once again, we're using that kind of an idea um, to say, well, we could get rid of, but if we get rid of this, then we have to, so if we downgrade it, then we're still meeting the proportionality, but they're not getting to play at the same level, but we'll save the men's sports because men's sports bring in more money. Well, unfortunately, to one degree, that can be true because of advertising, and so it's sort of the chicken. But unfortunately, it's just a continuation, sadly. And I think the economic situations that we're, that colleges and universities are in right now is only going to exacerbate it. I don't have, I, I really worry about the future of women's sports, um, particularly at schools just below the, that highest elite level that really um, struggle to, uh, to meet their payrolls and anything anyway, this is gonna be an easy way to make some cuts. Well, let's end it on a happy note. And um, I wanna ask you, who are the women in sports that we should be looking to? Who are the next superstars right now? Um, women, who is gonna be the next Megan Rapinoe? Who should we know about and look to? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, hard to say. I mean, there's a lot of them out there. Uh, I certainly, th I, I, I'm actually, instead of naming a particular individual, because it's I, I don't really have a good one, right? I think you could look to particular sports where you're going to see, and certainly I think the, the popularity of soccer, um, yeah, particularly if they can address this issue of the inequity in pay which is what the lawsuit and everything is all about. You're going to see young girls following in Rapinoe's um, footsteps um, coming out of um, the college ranks, which helps that sport. I think um, the Simone Biles of the world have, are gonna to continue to promote that idea in um, gymnastics and gymnastics will continue to be. Another area that we're seeing a lot of um, really cool things happening is in extreme sports. 
Uh, and I didn't really talk much about them, but following on the examples of the Lindsay Collins of the world and things, um, getting into some, particularly the winter extreme sports. Um, I think that's another area that you could look to, to watch for what kinds of things are going to happen. Um, the, and then tennis. Um, tennis is always an interesting one, though the U.S. doesn't right now seem to have anybody up and coming. It seems to be more on a world on a world basis. But tennis is always an interesting one um, to see who's going to follow the, the Williams sisters as they start to um, make their not yet, but they're on their on their exit um, into another level of participation. Well. Thank you so much, Leslie. This has been so interesting, really exciting. So the last question that I had, I can answer. Um, will this lecture um, be available? Yes, it will. So you can check on the National First Ladies Library Facebook page to access this. Um, and we will also be uploading it to YouTube. So please, um, if you caught us late and you popped in, you're welcome to check on those sources um, and see the whole thing, or if there's someone, um, a young sports up and comer, a young woman who you think should be watching this, um, please send them our way. So I want to thank Leslie for um, this amazing talk this morning, and I want to encourage you to connect up with us on social media. If you have questions about the talk, if you want to know more, um, please stay tuned, and uh, thank you so much, Leslie. Thank you. And thank everybody for coming. I, I really, really appreciate it and appreciate your um, kind attention. Um, it's always fun. And you can find me if you have more questions. Um, I teach at Kent Stark. So feel free. Great. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day. Thank you. You as well.